Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Reeker. I, uh, I work for Ohio State University Extension. I'm a county extension educator in Fulton County, which several of you drove through that county on your tour. Uh, perhaps some of you were on the, the Poultry Plus tour that I led uh, just, just uh, west of here, about 30 miles, so one county over. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about composting pen pack cattle manure for improved nutrient transport, really improved nutrient placement um, is, is really the the, uh, the thought or the idea. So uh, I'm gonna have to, I like to move. So I'm gonna be real honest. I like, I just, just I move a little bit. So um, at the start of COVID, um, Glenn Arnold actually said, hey, uh, there's a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative or a, a, a Glisner grant, a Great Lakes Sediment and Nutrient Reduction Grant that's available for NRCS, extension personnel and so on around the Great Lakes. We put in an application for uh, doing some pen pack cattle manure composting with about five cooperators. We kind of wrote it as a grant where they were doing some peer learning and peer education. And um, we went into that grant with some, some goals for kind of a collaborative project to work at moving nutrients further from the, the barn, less volume, less weight, increase the storage capacity of buildings um, and, and make a more stable nutrient dense product. Uh, when we think about um, manure storage buildings, okay. Um, in Northwest Ohio, we, we have these dry stack barns that have been cost shared with equip, okay, to store through the winter months or perhaps through the growing season. Um, I'm not sure if that's on my slide, but uh, in the um, in Northwest Ohio, there's been a significant amount of dry stack barns built. Okay, and so you, the the goal of moving nutrients farther, you know, you got the barn in one mile and eight miles away, you want to move the product, or else you just don't move the product. So the goal was simply in this graphic, you know, just kind of says, well, how can I take it from the barn and move it just a little bit further? Uh, so we worked with five manure storage barns or five collaborators, five farmers. Uh, they each built one or perhaps two. That's where we got a, a sample size of eight windrows. Um, I'm going to go through those five or six steps very quickly. Uh, this is very simple. Farmer with my farmer hat on, super simple, super, super basic, but hopefully practical research. Um, so they were asked to weigh in. We started with 258 uh, fresh tons of manure and ended up with 121 tons of finished compost. You can kind of see uh, in one of the manure barns. Uh, after it's just been turned. Uh, we weighed in, we built the windrows. Uh, we used, I'll talk a little bit more about the turner, but we used a pull type turner. It could receive windrows six foot by 12 foot by however long we could build them. Generally about a hundred foot long, 75 tons. I mean, what as a county educator, what I wanted to get away from was this small like rain barrel kind of super small composting. Uh, if you've ever worked with cattle integrators or cattle farmers in general, uh, they, you, you have very little time to do anything. It's got to be free and it's got to be big. Okay. So you tell them to build a six by 12 uh, windrow and they build a windrow that's 12 foot wide by 12 foot. I mean, just big windrows. They do things big. Um, and so I think I have a, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I talk with my hands and I move. So I'm this uh, really, so you can, if you don't get dizzy on my uh, little uh, smartphone kind of camera video, uh, that was at one of the days that we were running compost back in 2020. So we began this work in the fall of 2020. Um, at that point in time, equipment was very available. We had an awesome tractor that we rented. Um, we turned, so we, we weighed in, we built the windrow, we turned the piles. Six of our piles acted as, as our checks for future research. We turned them weekly, those six piles. They were under roof. We just did it under roof because it was, it was above board. We didn't have any leachate. We had manure storage barns. We started turning in the fall, generally after those barns were emptied. And the first clean out of the barn was the first windrow. So we had plenty of room. We used an HCL Machine Works compost turner, required 110 horsepower on the, on the PTO. Uh, our local Case IH dealer uh, rented us at, at a great rate, a 190 Magnum with a continuously variable transmission, a CVT. That's extremely important because we creeped through at 0.05 to 0.15 miles per hour at the fastest. 
Okay, so it's a slow process, but once you see that, you saw it in the video, once it goes through and adds air and kind of mixes really well, one of the, the beauties of the, the, the compost turner is the mixing and kind of the shredding sizing. It's not really aeration. If you go to a compost workshop, it's less about that thing aerating because that aerated windrow lasts for about an hour or two before it starts to settle and such. So number four, we track temperature. Uh, we had these hobo temperature turners there on the right that you see. And of course, we had a compost probe. We probe each, each pile before we turned it. Uh, Hobo's got an app that you can download these hobo turners for a couple hundred bucks. You can buy these hobo turners. You slip them down into half inch PVC into the center of the pile and it tracks that temperature over time. Uh, who can tell me what the spikes are? The spikes down, the valleys are from what? The days we pulled them out, it's tough to run those through the turner and keep them working. So we would pull them out, and that's where the temp dropped. And, and so you could track that. And my farmer down, the farmers, the cooperators downloaded this, and they would send me screenshots of it so I didn't have to drive out to the farm. And so it was kind of cool to watch them track that temperature and look for that temperature between 120 and 140 as kind of an ideal. And, of course, we wanted to get that compost over, over 160 for a period of time to really work down the pathogens. We didn't get overly scientific on the, the pathogens per se. Uh, what was really important to, again, cattle farmers was reducing the volume and the weight. So our step five was sampling. We sampled quite intense. So each time we would turn, we'd take each windrow and we kind of had flags identified as the three spots, our three sampling points. So we kind of sampled uh, at the same spot in each windrow each time, three samples per windrow per turn. And if you haven't read a manure sample before, and I think I'm speaking to the choir here, you probably all have read those key things that we were looking at was moisture coming in often between 60 and perhaps as high as 70% moisture. The second red square box was kind of a carbon to nitrogen ratio. This sample is a tick low. We should be in that 20 to 30 to one kind of carbon nitrogen ratio. Uh, but the, again, cattle farmers, they don't want to add much to it. They want to take it right out of the barn and start composting. And we were pretty close most of the time on C to N ratio and moisture. And then of course, when you get the nutrients back, we tracked the total usable nitrogen in the first year here represented by 8.7 pounds per applied ton, and then 6.5 pounds of P2O5 and 13, a little over 13 pounds of K2O, just one sample. Manure research is, is not a perfect science. And so the only way to kind of get it closer to perfect science is intense sampling, like soil sampling. And so that's kind of what we did. Sixth step was weigh it out and land apply it with that respective farmer. So they had to identify a field. We kind of prompted them a little bit to find a farm that was further away. We were going to create, you know, we were going to start with 75 to 100 tons and create a decent amount of finished product that they could carry further away from the barn. Um, really, that's not a huge number. 75 tons isn't a huge number for them to, to start with, but it got them a few loads to go to a farm that was further away. So that way in and way out number was really important because uh, I think Monica helped pass out some sheets. Thank you, Monica. Um, you have at the top of your paper, this was just a super quick summary to the cooperators, to the, the folks that, that we partnered with, the tractor dealership, other farmers. This is a super quick infographic that we created in our local extension office that said, this is what we did um, and they either turned one farmer turned as few as five times and one farmer turned as many as eight times over an eight week period. So once a week, the extra two or three windrows were kind of second treatments. We turned half as often or we put one outside in one case. So the quick and dirty is we started on average with eight, eight compost piles or a sample size of eight started at an average of 66% moisture down to 48, 53 uh, percent reduction in weight. And then we total usable nitrogen essentially stayed the same per applied ton, but where we made significant gains were in those, those key nutrients of phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and calcium, nearly doubling all those, if not more from the start to the finish inside of eight weeks. In some cases, as quick as six weeks, we doubled the nutrient density and made that product more nutrient stable uh, and, and better, uh, better for that farmer to carry down the road. You have this full sheet in front of you. Um, and so, like I said, this is something just super simple that we handed to the stakeholders, if you will. The other three uh, kind of infographics, you got the poop emoji there that represents uh, how, how we kind of chipped away at the amount of, of, of 
product and weight, 258 tons down to 121. Uh, the number that's really important to cattle producers is the number of loads. So they're really as concerned about volume as anything. And so we, we would like to see that number go better. And in talking, Terry Mesher does some of this with uh, on his home farm. And he's seen that number get even better if you can let it sit longer. And so in a very intense amount of time, five to eight weeks, we reduced our volume by 28%, one out of four loads. Okay, so that's one last trip to a farm further away. The last graphic there is this picture in gray of Fulton County. And on average, these five collaborators hauled this manure to a farm that was an on average four and a half miles away versus the, the field right out back. Okay, one producer hauled this manure 16 miles to a farm that did not have any history of manure application. And that, from a placement perspective, was our ultimate goal, was to get, get a, incentivize guys to, to do those things. These are also collaborators, farmers that are working with the H2 Ohio program, perhaps they're putting in a small grain, perhaps they're putting in cover crops, and also this manure application. And so it was kind of a win-win-win in a lot of ways. We did land application. I'm gonna wrap, wrap up kind of the last third of my presentation is on, on field, uh, field application, okay? And um, you can see one of our collaborators putting this on. This is not, uh, again, super scientific, okay? But we use the equipment that the growers had. This is a night side slinger. There are better, better spreaders. Again, if you know a cattle guy, very few of them are going out to buy new manure spreaders, okay? Um, and so our, our last step as a part of the grant was that each of the collaborators, in order to get their $1,000 cooperator payment, they had to design a field trial where they used that, manure, used that compost against either the raw product straight out of the barn or commercial fertilizer. And so we did some of these in the 2021 e-fields. Some of you perhaps got that book yesterday, but in that field where you saw Scott, one of the cooperators working, you you know, it's not perfect, but we harvested the center. So we set up his AB lines at 30 feet swaths and he harvested the center six. And so we really believe we did a pretty good job getting right over the raw manure and then also over the compost and manure. There's some additional research that needs to be done on the soil health benefits of that compost versus the raw manure. Uh, we didn't build that into our grant, but that's, that's something that I'm really interested in. We compared three cornfields uh, comparing to fresh manure, and then we had a fourth project where we, comp we, we called it our uh, meeting two-year tri-state fertility needs with manure, compost, or fertilizer. I'll share three out of those four results. So in corn grain trial number one, uh, we had 10 tons of manure, which was, was kind of the raw product versus five tons of compost because our nutrient density essentially doubled. So we're taking half as much tonnage, uh, the yield difference, there was no statistical difference in yield. If you look at the right-hand column, 252 versus 245. Uh, grain trial number two, there we go. Um, this individual, this is actually the farm we went to, very teachable moment. We had no manure or compost applied. That was our check versus six tons of manure out of the barn versus three tons of compost. When you look at the right-hand column, no statistical difference in yield. This is a very good opportunity to talk with this grower that, you know, perhaps those soil test phosphorus levels were at a, a level sufficient already, okay? But there's no statistical difference in yield between the manure and the compost. The final trial that I'll share with you is what I call the tri-state trial. I have farmers that come up to me and say, I know when I use manure in a field, I get what better water percolation, I get better yields, I'm improving my, my organic matter, but I don't have yield data. The university doesn't have yield data to compare that. So we found a cooperator that had a field with little manure, with no manure history in the last generation. Okay. And so we applied the tri-state Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, the tri-state fertility recommendation for a two-year spread. So that's 200 pounds of potash, 100 pounds of MAP, and 50 pounds of AM ammonium sulfate for those of you who are agronomists. Essentially a really close two-year spread. Um, and then 10 tons of manure per acre and five tons of compost. And so when you get down to it, there was no statistical difference between the manure and the compost in the field trials on this corn yield. Similarly, there was no difference between the tri-state fertilizer and the compost. So those were considered equals too, if you understand statistical analysis. In 2022, on this exact farm, we'll be keeping the soybean data because the same farmers that were bending my ear about manure doing better than commercial fertilizer were saying, 
we know our soybean yields are better on manure fields. We know that our nutrient uptake is better. We know that, that, that we're exporting more nutrient off that field because of the grain that's produced, the higher grain yields that are produced in that corn and then soybean yield. So uh, really, I, I'm kind of an agronomist at heart, not a super geeky manure guy like Glenn Arnold, but uh, I really enjoy uh, doing the manure research with growers, especially when anhydrous is 1,500 pounds and math is 1,050 per ton. Um, to wrap up, you know, there is more work needed in this space, and this is a three-year grant with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and so we'll uh, the, our problem this year was uh, there isn't a tractor to be rented in the United States. I didn't try Canada, but I cannot get a Case IH Magnum with the CVT transmission. So we're using a, a, a 1965, 1066 open platform uh, Case IH tractor with the hydro. That's if you came out to the tour yesterday, that's what we're using this year. And it took us a while to talk that farmer into using it. Uh, it was a whole lot nicer when we had a cab tractor with an infinitely variable transmission that I talked about or that you see in the picture. We need economic analysis. We need soybean yield the following year. We could turn based on, on O2 or CO2, okay, versus temperature or versus uh, we were turning every Wednesday. We were just trying to get baseline data. And so every Wednesday, Water Quality Associate and I or I went out and turned. Uh, if you were at the Stuckey site yesterday, they added gypsum. They wanted to add some gypsum into one windrow. And so in 2022, we had a check strip, just straight manure out of the barn. We had another one with gypsum applied. And so they wanna learn just a little bit more about that. Thanks to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for the grant money. Are there any questions? It was a great question. The question was uh, the law of diminishing returns, how perhaps how, how few of turns can I get and still accomplish a, 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 the same thing? Uh, I don't have necessarily data, I would say, Bill, but just kind of the art of, of working with it. I would say we don't have to turn that long. And if I'm using, if I'm willing to take the skid loader and push that dry stack manure to the back of the barn and not drive over it, or if I have a payloader to keep it as fluffy as possible to perhaps keep that temperature up in that 120 to 140, I could turn is probably those first three turns are critical. And then one of the things I didn't put data up here, if you have straw based manure in those pen pack systems, our, pat, our potash numbers are phenomenal. They're much better than straw than sawdust based, um, but you have to go through straw based manure about four times until your machine stops going. It, it's really hard on the machines. So did I answer your question? Three to four turns, I think we could accomplish it. Yes, Sandy. Not with this study. I, d I did not collect that, that information. Um, that would be an interesting data point. We believe that the compost is more stable. Um, it, is, it is incorporated. Uh, it takes a little bit more effort and uh, wear and tear on equipment and labor. But good question. I, I would love to add that component. It wasn't built into the grant at this point. And I'm, a one, I'm, I'm just a little county educator, one man shop, one man shop. Thank you.